Well, good morning, church family. Oh, that, that's how good this microphone is. Even if I'm making a mistake, it still picks me up. All right. It's good to be together with you guys today, worshiping God. Um, I just want to say as we begin our time of study that, um, praise band, thank you so much for taking us through worship this morning. Um, I, I get to know that went on, on both ends of the spectrum for me this morning, which was nostalgia. Um, I grew up with an incredible father, and he had a lot of faults, but he was a loving man who cared for me and presented Jesus Christ to me on a regular basis. And sometimes that was with a loving hand, sometimes that was with stern encouragement to follow Christ. <laughs> Some of you understand the stern encouragement aspect. And so to sing that song, A Good, Good Father, I have a great context for that. Because a father who loved and cared, and, and his, his currency, his, the language that he spoke to the world in was through giving. And he just had a huge heart. And so when I sing that song, I'm reminded of, of my earthly father, who was a great demonstration of who my godly father is. But on the other end of that spectrum, is, is, as a kid, I remember going to church on Sunday mornings and singing that song. Not good, good father, because it wasn't written that long ago. But my anchor holds within the veil, Christ alone. I remember singing that as a kid. And so, Pastor Tim, thank you so much, and praise man, thank you for taking us through that and being able to look at the new and the old and the old and the new married together and expressing that in beautiful ways. And so hopefully I'm not the only person who had a good worship time this morning. But if I am, sorry, suckers, that's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go. Um, you, you've gotten to know some of my quirks, right, um, and some of my idiosyncrasies and some of the problems I have as an individual, but... Um, you need to know that there's one thing about me is that I'm, I'm curious. I'm extremely curious about most things in life. Um, and I have this um, incessant question that goes on about the why. And I want to figure things. I want to know how it works. And that would drive my dad crazy when we would spend um, summers in, in, in Red River, New Mexico, sitting around the trout pond. And we're, we're, we're fishing for trout. And, and I would ask him questions about how do fish live and what, how do they breathe and what do they eat and where do they go to the bathroom and all that kind of stuff. And he would, you know, start off answering those questions. He'd kind of chuckle a little bit and he'd, you know, answer and we'd interact. And then after like the 50 or 60th question, he would just finally say, enough. Say more questions for later. We're done asking questions. And it would be stuff like, Dad, would you drink this water if you were thirsty enough? Why are you asking that question? I don't know. I'm just wondering. It looks clean, but I wonder, is it really clean? And, and then I'd ask questions. You know, the fish eat these eggs. Would you eat these eggs for like for breakfast or something? No, I wouldn't. Stop asking those questions. So that was just me as a child. And it's not abnormal for me to do things like sit in front of the washing machine and think, how does this really wash my clothes? How did I go from a, you know, you couldn't wash it a long time ago because the spindle had to be covered up with a solid piece of metal, right? And I, that was, I was born after some of you maybe had to crank the, the, the washing machine or maybe you had the foot pedal. I remember my mom telling me about my grandmother, you know, doing the foot pedal and she had pretty good rhythm with doing the washing machine. Maybe yours had a motor on it, but it was an open tub. And, but I remember just sitting there thinking, how does this work? And you open the, the, the door back before the lock latches, right? To me, it's super dangerous. It's a surprise that any of you know, kids from my generation are living today. But you open up the, the tub top, and you look in, and it stopped moving. And I'm like, my clothes just sit there soaking in water. So I close the door again, and I'd hear it kick back up. And you open the door again and look in, and it'd be stopped. And it would drive me nuts because I couldn't see what was happening. And then, then I saw in a store one day that there was a, a clear plexiglass lid to this upright washing machine. And I just sat there for moments just watching that spindle go side to side. And it was just this, uh, and you look at me going, you're entertained by a, wash, a, a clothes washing machine. Yeah, absolutely, because I'm seeing this magic thing happen. How did it go that I've got these dirty clothes with, with grass stains and mud and dirt and, and whatever filth is on those things, and they come out, and they're almost like brand new? And now I have this TV edition washing machine that actually t faces me. It's a front loader, and I can just sit there. The lights come on, and it just turns. And then it turns this way, and it turns that way, and I'm just fascinated by it because I want to know what is actually happening. So how do your clothes actually get clean? Well, if you do a little research, you'll know that there are certain chemicals and certain processes. The more clothes you have in there, it, it agitates, and some of that stuff gets worked off, and the chemicals in the, in the soap and the, whatever it is. I mean, if you remember the days of the caustic lye soap that, that women used to make to wash clothes, and that stuff, that would take the grease off of an engine. That stuff is powerful, right? And so I, I just, I'm curious as to how it works. 
But there's one thing, of all the things I've, you know, I, I click on something and I find there's something that works, I'm like, okay, how does that take place? Okay, how does an engine work? How does it that you have combustion, you've got exhaust, you've got fresh air, and, and you've got extraction, you've got putting in, you've got, you know, in fuel injectors, you've got, you know, carbon monoxide dioxide pouring out, and, and how does that take place? And there's actually a guy who's done that with a, a, an acrylic um, valve cover. It's the most fascinating thing I've ever seen. But there's one thing I've come across that I have not found an explanation for yet. I've eaten it, I've studied it, I've tasted it, I've asked questions, I've looked online, I've even gone to the website of the company that makes this particular product, and I've, you know, I've, I've looked, is there this, do they have this science page of, of how it happens? And this stuff has been around for you know, decades. Most of you probably use it in your cooking. If you've ever fried catfish with cornmeal, you probably put a little dash of it in your cornmeal mix or in your, your egg wash. Some of you, when you eat your tacos, you, you put a couple of dashes on that, right? And if you like Cajun sauce and you know, gumbo and, and etouffee, you, you might put a little dash of it inside there. But the problem is, is that scientists don't know how Tabasco is actually made. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, that's ridiculous. It's a table condiment. Of course they know how it's made. If you watch anything or go look online, there is something magical that happens that once this, the, this puree is put into this oak barrel that's been seasoned and conditioned, and they put a lid on it, they pack salt on top of it, and they store it for a, a certain amount of time that they can't tell you what is actually happening in the process of it changing. All they know is, is that when the time is up, they scrape the salt off, and what comes out is, is beautiful red juice that makes everything taste just a little bit better. And that blows me away that something so common that's been around for so long that we can't really figure out how it works. We know how it goes in, and we know how it comes out, we know how it tastes, we know how uh, you, you puree stuff all together, and all the, the seasonings, the spices, the herbs, all the things that are put together. But they can't figure out at what point how it changes from this thing of a bunch of combination of things becomes one thing. And if you start to break down things a little bit more, <clears throat> you'll realize that when we really think we understand things, what it comes down to is we have a bunch of theories. So the question we have to ask is, in our spiritual life, is there something that's going on that we may not fully understand? And this baffles me. Because I'm a man who, who is, I've got, you know, I've got secondary degrees, I've got a, a college education, I went to high school and graduated. It's a different story about how I graduated, but I got there, I made it out, I went to junior high, I did well in elementary school, I, I conquered crayons in kindergarten. But there's just certain part of the Christian life that I can't explain. How is it that one person can study scripture and it just speaks to them in a beautiful language? That the imagery makes sense. It inspires them. They respond to it and they try to think, how can I make this part of who I am? How do I become a person that's described in, in this? When it says about what a Christian is and it labels these specific actions and they just begin to feel this urge, it inspires them to move. And then there are some people who have read scripture their whole life and it's just a book. It means really nothing. They, they read it, it's confusing, it doesn't make sense. And so we as human beings, we try to, to streamline that process. We try to give questions to ask and look at the context. Do we understand the definitions? What's the original language? And we begin to develop a process to try to help people understand what the Word of God is saying to us. But there is a part of this thing in the Christian life that you can't explain through methodology. It really doesn't matter what color chairs you have in the church. It doesn't matter what the, the layout is, the square footage doesn't matter if you have two rows that go straight back that are set pews or if it's dynamic chairs that sometimes your crazy pastor puts into the middle. It doesn't matter if, if you have the correct lighting, if they're LED or incandescent or spotlights or halogen. It doesn't matter if you have the, the ambiance of the spirit on stage and, and the kind of the essence of, of fragrance without the smell of it, a.k.a. fog. I don't know if you know this, but if you go back to the origins of the fog machine, it's actually Old Testament temple. I don't know if you guys realize this, but in the Old Testament temple, there was this thing that sat on the, on the furniture, and they would put this um, uh, frankincense or myrrh. They would put these, these pieces, and they would light them on fire, and it would create the smoke. And the smoke would fill the holy place. 
And as you walk into the holy place, that fragrance reminded you the presence of God is in all places at all times and is active. God described the, the altar that as the, the, the animal was burnt and the smoke came up and it filled everything, that it was a reminder of God's presence in that moment, that this was a sacred place. That's Old Testament fog machine. Now, whether you use it or not, it doesn't really matter. But there's something happening that we have a hard time explaining. How is it possible that a man who may have grown up with children, raised children, and raised them poorly? He didn't treat them correctly. He didn't inspire them. He didn't create a home that was safe. He was a harsh father. And how was it all of a sudden one day, because of a belief in a man who died on the cross, who rose from the grave and ascended 40 days later, that man changed his heart? Or maybe I should say his heart was changed. And he went from being a ruthless father to a loving, compassionate dad. How do we explain that? We oftentimes say, well, he finally got his act together. Right? He finally reached down and grabbed his bootstraps and pulled them up. He, he finally understood and he responded, and he's been a good man since then. He's worked really hard. The problem is, is that that takes out the biggest part of the equation of our faith, which is the spirit. There's something happening in the heart of that man, and that's what I, I wonder at times. How is it that I got to this place? Because I'll be honest with you, as honest as I can be from stage, I've made a lot of mistakes. Last August, we celebrated 24 years of marriage, and, I, and I, I looked across the table at my wife, and I thought, how did we get here? Because early on, it was really it was sketchy. It was questionable within the first three years of our marriage if we were going to make it this far, and we're not done yet. Is it because I all of a sudden became a good husband? I did it myself. She finally realized who I was. How many times have we said this to our spouse in the moment of a conflict? This is just who I am. You married me and you knew who I was. And I'm never going to change. Which means you make a decision. You can stay and take it. Or you can go. But is that really the thing we hold we hold on to, is it the, the, the hook we hang our hat on for Christians? That who I am today is as good as it's going to get. And, and what I do today is what I will always do. And the people who are affected by that, well, you just better enjoy it. Because I will say this, that's not what we see in Scripture. And, and I would love to tell you, it's the number of, of, of courses you've gone through that you've earned little, little plaques for. 100 hours of study, 200 hours of study, 5,000 hours of study. I would love to tell you that that is the golden key. I would love to tell you that it's the fact that you came in here at, at, at 1025 and you wore the same shoes you wore last week when God moved. And those are your spiritual shoes and you need to wear those every Sunday. And, and I would love to tell you that it's the, the way that those ladies at the counter make those coffee drinks. And if you watch, if they put it in the correct order, good things will happen for you. Do you see what I'm getting at? We look for every possible explanation of why we are experiencing incredible things in our lives. And sometimes we even take the credit for it. But the reality is, as a believer, there's something happening that we don't understand. You like that, huh? But that's scary. Because I can't predict it. I can't control it. If I go back to a story I told you earlier about going into Central Park. See, here, here's the, 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 the scary storyline for me, the place that I will go to. If you remember the storyline of me sitting in Central Park and having a moment where God was reaffirming my call to ministry and me to serve in, in FCA. And I was sitting in a rock in Central Park and there were a couple of homeless guys around me. If I'm not careful what I will attribute, that moment of realization and revelation from God was based because this was a holy site and the rocks were sacred. And I would want to go out there the next Sunday and gather those same homeless people. Are you Bob? Were you here last week when some dude was praying about and he started talking? No, you weren't there. Can you move off that rock, please? Because I need that guy to come back. And, and I start to, don't take offense to this, but I want you to see the, the issues I have. I begin to write his name on that rock. And this is his spot. He has to sit here. 
right? And when the rock gets a little dirty, I'm going to take the, so I'm going to clean the rock and make it look like it did at that one point when God moved. Because it's the moment, it's the place, it's the, it's the settings, it's the decorations that made this place sacred. And I remember the moment I was confronted by this realization of what is this thing that really changes people was when I was setting up trips for college students to go do missions. And I would hold on to it. And this is high school students too, but I would hold on to it until the, the great reveal day which is like in April for a a July trip. And every year, my older students would say, we're going to go to New York. And people are like, why would we go to New York? I mean, it's a great place to do ministry, but why are we going to New York? Because that's where he had a spiritual experience, and that's probably where he's going to take us every time. They were trying to predict what I was going to do based on how I felt about something. And they didn't attribute that movement to anything other than the location. I was baptized in a small church, a Baptist church, in Irving, Texas. I was nine years old. It was the week after Easter. Burnt orange carpet, burnt orange decoration, dark colored wood, kind of like this, as far as the seat arrangement. We don't have burnt orange. I'm not colorblind. So if I'm not careful, that incredible moment of me accepting Christ and me being baptized in that church, I would want to hold on and I never could leave that place because it's the most sacred place for me. And so when it says that Jesus is the cornerstone, it reminds me that it's not a building that I hold on to for this work to take place. You see, if if there's a new me that God has in plans, he knows what it looks like. It's what he created me to do. If that new me... It's going to happen because there's a new agreement, a new covenant in place because of Jesus Christ. Then once the agreement is there, then there's got to be something that helps me to understand how to live in that agreement. If you go back, we said there were really two, three or four things that were important about this new covenant, but two of them were there was a new high priest in place who was perfect. He would never fail us, and there was a new agent that was given to help us live in this new life. I want you to hear how Jesus describes this thing, this moment when he reveals that something will come to help you. We're going to look specifically in in the Gospels, John chapter 14. Now let me just buffer this. We're not doing an exhaustive study of the Holy Spirit. We have 30 to 45 minutes. Some of you are praying for 30, some of you are like the 45, but somewhere in that time frame we're we're going to study the scripture. There's more to study. But I will say that everything that you ever come across, everything when it comes to the Holy Spirit, can be condensed and brought down to this primer, to this prime thing. The Spirit gifts, the Spirit changes, the Spirit moves. He was was there in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. When there was nothing, it was void, except the Spirit of God hovered above the plain. He is eternal. In the intertestamental period, you know, at Christmas time, we, we fasted from communion. And we said this is an observance of God's silence for 400 years. But what we understand is in those 400 years, he restricted the work of the Spirit. If the word of God is brought to us by the Holy Spirit, then when he didn't speak, when he didn't reveal his word, he was holding the Holy Spirit back. And so there was a season, that 400 years, that the Holy Spirit did not do what the Holy Spirit had been doing. And it's hard for us to understand that there is a difference. The Holy Spirit had been empowering people. The Holy Spirit had been involved in people's lives. He had been equipping them to do things. He gave them power. So it wasn't like there was no Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden Jesus reveals there's going to be, and he shows up for the first time. If you go back even to the story of Mary, how did Mary get pregnant? Because the Holy Spirit. But something is going to change Because the high priest who will be in place and by the shedding of perfect blood will create a new agreement and a new relationship. And he promises to do something to help us live in that relationship. And that's where we start. Jesus' description of the Holy Spirit, starting in verse 15 of John chapter 14. Let me get to the scripture on the screen and we'll move forward. Okay, starting in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even 
the spirit of truth. Uh, here we go. There we go. Okay. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also live. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And will live by my Father, and I will live in him, and love him, and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that, we, that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love does not know and does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, I want you to understand there's this impossible thing that Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. See, the, the new agreement means that because the high priest is in place, that now there's this agreement to live with him and by him. But I will tell you this, it's impossible to keep those things. And so now what he's done is he's given us an expectation that we can't fulfill. We can't live it. And we hate to admit that. You're like, Pastor, wait a minute. You just said earlier that there's this thing happening that we don't fully understand. It helps us to do these things. And now you're saying Jesus has called us to do something we can't do. And yeah, and that's the beautiful part. The only way possible that we can carry out what this has said to us, what we read in this, is because the helper will come. It's not because I study as hard as I can. It's not because I have a high intellect. It's not because I have the right version of the Bible that is bound correctly with the appropriate leather and has silver trim as opposed to gold trim, because gold trim people don't quite get it. They're so obs uh, obsessed with gold and, and money and stuff. They don't quite. But if you've got a silver one, it's a little bit I'm, I'm playing. It's because the helper will come. Now the question becomes, if God is going to send the helper in Jesus, when he goes into the place of, of darkness, when he's crucified on the cross, he's laid, he's buried, and then he resurrects, there's going to be something that's going to come help us to live in this new relationship. And I want you to hear what Jesus does to describe what this helper will do. Okay? He will describe him in this term here. That the Holy Spirit will come, and his primary objective is to glorify Christ. The Holy Spirit, in all that he does, is working to this end. Now, I don't normally try to wrap everything up in a simple phrase or two words, because really the Spirit's doing a lot of things. But if I read through Acts, there's a lot of instances of healings. There's a lot of instances of empowering. There's testimonies given because the Holy Spirit was empowering people. But every time something happens, this comes back. They're given an opportunity. The Spirit is working to glorify Christ. If he is the high priest, and he is the one by which relationship will happen, and he is the one by which believers in Christ can live this life, then Christ has to be glorified. Now, I believe that there are three aspects of this glorification that we see in Scripture. I want you to, to look, and you can turn here if you want to. We're looking at John chapter 16. Okay? But in John chapter 16, Jesus identifies this idea of glorification. But I want you to listen to where it begins. Because all of us in this room... We're in a place where the Holy Spirit did this for us. Jesus said in verse 7, starting in John 16, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, 
because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And that the Father has his mind. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. That word conviction, that we oftentimes think of it as a, a judgment. The judgment has been passed. In, in, in legal terms, you've got to take a step back from that. Conviction actually means revelation. In a courtroom sense, when all the evidence has been brought forth and all the witnesses have had a chance to speak and, and everything has been deliberated and both sides have had a chance to, to address the judge or the jury, then there's a moment where there's a, a passing and a gavel hammers and it says you have been convicted and found guilty of X, Y, Z or found innocent. And that conviction is simply that there's a revelation that's been given. And I don't know where you were or what was going on when you realized that you were a person who was struggling with sin, a lack of righteousness, and judgment was upon you. But all of us who claim to be sons of Jesus Christ and daughters of Jesus Christ have come to this moment. And that revelation, that conviction moved you to say, I want forgiveness. I know that Jesus Christ is the only way to be forgiven. And so the Spirit is revealing this. There is no person on the face of the planet who can come to God except through Jesus Christ. And the Spirit is working to make sure people know that. I believe that there are some people who reject that. They hear it, and it just doesn't make sense. I know, I saw you put the Tabasco in the, in the barrel, and I saw it come out and I put it in my tacos, but I don't really know what happens in there, and since I don't know, I've got to back away, and I'm not going to eat any more Tabasco sauce. I can't do it. If I can't fully understand the process and break it down scientifically, I'm out of here. Some people were wide open to this, and as the Spirit revealed things in their life, He convicted them, they understood this weight that was upon them, and the future was separation forever. And they said, Jesus Christ, please hear my prayer. Forgive me. You are the Son of the living God. You died on a cross. You were buried. You rose three days later, and you ascended, and you sit at the right hand of God. I believe that with all my heart. And now come be Jesus. Come be Lord of my life. The Spirit is revealing that to all people. And Jesus says, it will glorify me because there's salvation. Not only does the Spirit glorify Christ the world, but he also glorifies Christ in believers. This is a, an often quoted passage, but I, I want you to hear what, what, what Paul says to the Galatian church. That if Christ is supreme, if Christ is over all things, if Christ is the one in which re relationship happens, then the Spirit, when he comes, will do something to you. He will work within you, and the evidence of that comes through this. And there's a lot of things we try to give evidence to the Spirit about. But in Scripture, there's a lot of weight put here. And so Paul writes to them, but the fruit of the Spirit, this thing that's coming out of you because of spiritual work, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things there is no law. You want to do a, a, a primer test? You want to do a test on your life? You want to say, okay, I, I know I believe in Jesus. I had that moment. I put my trust in him. But, but how active is the spirit in me? Do these things exist in who you are? Jesus lived these things perfectly. When I was a kid, I wanted to play running back in football. I, I mean, that and quarterback were the two positions that any good kid, in my opinion, should want to play. Because I wanted to touch the football. Now, I guess really what I should have done is been center, because that guy always has the football in his hands. <laughs> right? But I was dumb enough to think that the glory positions were the place I wanted to be. But you need to understand, there's two fatal flaws in me. I could not be a running back because I was too slow and I was too heavy. 
No, some of you are thinking, well, heavy, this is good. You just run over those little kids. You step on them, they scream a little bit, but you keep going. They just hang on you. You just take them down like a wedding train, <clears throat> walk into the end zone. The league I played then, though, had a, had a weight limit because they didn't want to kill little kids with big kids. And you understand, when I was a little kid, I wasn't like I was huge tall, but I was girth. That's a better way of saying fat, <laughs> okay? Slow, fat, white kid. That's not a good combination for a running back, by the way. So I didn't possess the skills to meet the dreams. And I will tell you this, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus and these things don't exist in you, then something's happening or something's not there. And you need to know walking away from this, you can claim a lot of things. I've claimed a pew at Hilltop Drive Baptist Church. I've claimed a seat at Plymouth Park Baptist Church. I've stood on, uh, on the stage and from the pulpit at Grace Baptist Church, and, and I've passed through the bridge. I stand here now, but you know what? Those things don't make me a Christian. That's the outflow. That's the result. Somebody asked me if I would share my career with students, and I'm like, sure. But you've got to understand, the first qualification for being a pastor is Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that first. Okay. So we're about to have come Jesus. If you've you got career down, your, your plans, students, come to mind. It's going to be revival, possibly. That's what we're praying for. I can't be involved in the spirit if these things aren't there. If I'm angry towards people, i got a spiritual problem. If I like this self-control thing, okay, can, can we take down one of these? Can we say, okay, um, you know, this, this kindness thing, that's kind of a weak thing. If I'm negotiating for a used car, can I cover this one up just for a moment? And my used car salesman says, no, I want to I see your kindness. Let Jesus flow through you. Treat me with respect. The service guy comes to our house, and we've got to get this thing fixed today. Because I don't like it when it's 70 degrees outside and my air conditioning's not on. My heater doesn't run right. And so I'm going to pull out this patience card and just kind of set that off to the side. But, man, I love, love is there because I love good air conditioning. I love a good, peaceful house. Do you see the problem? These things are existing. This is the fruit that shows you that the Spirit is working in your life. Not only is it working to reveal Christ in the world, working to reveal Christ in believers, but it's also glorifying Christ through us. And many times we stop at number two. We study those things, but we don't ask the question, how is this going to play out? In Acts chapter 1, 8. And Jesus tells them, go, wait, right? I need you to go and be and just be, be patient because something's about to happen. And he says to them at a certain point, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, that's great. A little, little Hulk moment, spiritually speaking. So what now? And he says, then, when that happens, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus did not promise anything other than the fact that if the Spirit is upon you, then you're going to testify about who he is to the world. And Mark describes... And the other gospel writers do too, but Mark describes this process by which the disciples were sent out, first the 12, then the 72. And when they walked out, they were walking out and going without all the things they thought they would need. He said, don't take your, your, your stuff, you don't need it. AKA what he was saying was, don't rely upon your own things. Just go. And when you go, you will teach, you will heal, you will cast out demons, and you will testify, but, but don't take the stuff. But as you go to houses, knock on the door, and I will provide a place for you to stay. If they don't accept you, wipe the dirt off and go to the next house. And so he was cultivating the, the previous thing. You have seen me, you've experienced me, you have understood my words to you, but now it's time to go out and be me in the world. The part of the story of the man who is in the tombs naked is the fact that if he gets clothes on, I really appreciate that in the storyline, but number two, when he comes back to the boat and wants to get in, what does Jesus say? No. They're kicking Jesus out of the ten cities. And Jesus says, go and tell them what I have done for you. Are you part of this? 
Have you had those moments where you can't explain why you're at United eating lunch in the cafeteria and all of a sudden some sweet woman shows up and she's just come from the hospital because her loving husband is in isolation because he's got the flu. How do you explain that? What do you do in that moment? In order for us to live in this new covenant, which is impossible for us to do, we have to have the help of the Spirit. Period. Now, there's a thing that I can do. I can put myself in God's Word, and what I'm praying is, God, shape me and help me to understand. Do you realize that after three years of walking with Jesus, the disciples still didn't understand Judas' question in the beginning? Why? I don't understand why you would hold yourself from the world and reveal yourself to me. I don't get it. And over and over again, I can just see Jesus is like, oh. You guys still don't understand what I'm saying here. But Jesus realized that there was a spiritual thing about to happen. And it isn't until his resurrection, the 40 days he's walking, when he begins to speak to them, and there's a part of the scripture that blows me away. And it says, in that moment, the Spirit opened the hearts and the minds of the disciples to understand what he was saying to them. We can't do it on our own. And so I wonder, do you crave the Spirit like that? Do you feel kind of like your spiritual life is brr? It's not really on fire. You're kind of missing something, and, and you're not really sure what it is. And I'll tell you right now, it's, it's most likely going to tie back to this. You want to find depth in a Bible study? This is where depth is found. You can have the best teachers in the world, but if you're not interacting with the Spirit and living in that relationship, there is no depth of understanding. It's shallow. So how to respond? If the Spirit is moving to reveal Christ to the world, if he's glorifying himself to us, and he's glorifying himself through, through us, and the Spirit's doing that for Jesus into this world, then what is our response to this? And I think there's a thing of recognition and revelation. When there are moments when something happens that you can't explain, that you're attested in a way that normally you would erupt and you would break down in, in this fruits of the Spirit, they would die off. They would be on the vine just black as they could be. But for some reason, this day, when I'm tested in that way, I find victory. And I recognize that the Spirit is working in me, and I'm giving thanks. We all have those, those addictions, those places, those old habits that keep just kind of cutting at our Achilles heel. I'm not, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, we all have them. And as your pastor, I'm saying we. <laughs> but you ever had that moment when you realize that attack is coming and you say, not today. Jesus, help me in this moment. Give me strength. Make me the different person that you've claimed I can be. Let me live in that victory. And it goes. It disappears. Oh, that's not me. That's Jesus Christ. The Spirit has come. Praise God for that. But in the Revelation, when there are moments when I glorify myself over Christ... I deserve, I've earned, I should get better. People shouldn't treat me like that. I need to be made known, my skills, my desires, I, I'm the focus here. My family runs because of me. Get that in your head. Whatever it is that you've realized all of a sudden that, that you are higher than Christ, that Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, does not exist in you or it's missing or somehow it just didn't produce. And most of us have been there, and we kill ourselves in that moment. I never, I can't, this isn't going to work. And I would say what has happened is, is that the Spirit has revealed to you that there's a place that fruit isn't growing. And what Christ tells us to do is to come back and repent that. Ask for forgiveness. We give thanks to God because he's revealed this in our life that isn't pleasing to him, that doesn't line up with the Spirit, and isn't glorifying Christ. But in my, my repentance, now Christ is being glorified. The same action that is undermining me now becomes something that I can give thanks for. Father, thank you for revealing this in me. I don't want it, but I'm aware of it now, and I'm going to repent and ask for the Spirit's help. Paul writes to, to Timothy, in, I believe it's in 2 Timothy, but as he writes this letter, he makes this statement. If you meet a man, and this is the Kevin Britton translation, if you meet a man who there is no power in his faith, that God 
cannot change things. Flee that man. I am a firm believer that the Spirit transforms people because I'm a person who's experienced that. And I'm a person that God in His grace continues to reveal places that I've not let transformation take place. And I want to put my hands around it and I want to control it. And I want to be God in the moment. But praise Jesus. He speaks into my heart and says, that's not you. Let me take care of this for you. That's the beauty of the new covenant. The Spirit lives within me. He is the power of working in me. We talk about Jesus raised from the dead, but the same Spirit was the same thing that brought Lazarus out of the grave. Now we understand what Jesus did because he never experienced death again, but that same Spirit is what God gave us as the helper and is working within us. And so it's not a hopeless issue. I'm not going to be tied to these sins any longer. I can turn to the Spirit. I can ask God, please give me power to overcome this. Let me see the change. Now the question becomes, when someone recognizes that things have changed in you, whether by what you say or what you do or how you treat people, how you spend your money, how you interact, how you work, whatever it is that's a revelation for the world, who's the credit? Now, you know, I've been trying really hard. I gave myself five things to say to my wife every day. I say them with kindness. In fact, before I walk in the house, I spend 20 minutes in my car saying them out loud so I can say them with kindness. I look at myself in the mirror, and I look at my responses, and I think, am I saying it that it shows kindness and respect to my wife? I've worked very hard to do this. Or do you say, I had a desire to love my spouse more deeply than I could do it by myself? And God began to show me how to do that. I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. I routinely will tell my, my daughter why it's important for our young girls who believe, who claim Christ, to date Christian men. Nice guys, by the way. I'm fighting for the nice guys. If you're not a nice guy, I'm not fighting for you. Sorry. <laughs> and here's the reason why. I know personally how hard it is to love another person. I know how hard it is to love somebody for 24 years plus. When you've got some things in the background that, that weren't nice and you didn't do well with each other, I know what it takes to love a person like that. I know what it means to ask for forgiveness to be given to you and you accept that forgiveness and you, you live differently. And the only reason I know that is because of Jesus Christ and the work of the Spirit. And that's why it's important because another person won't understand how to love you. And their love will take from you. And one day you'll end up bankrupt. I know what it's like to love a three-year-old who looks at you and says, I hate you. And I know in my heart, in my mind, that's not what they really mean. They're trying to, to get across these emotions and they don't know how to express it and they want to fight back and control the situation. And they really don't mean it. Now, you may think they understand it as a 16-year-old, but they still don't understand it and they probably don't mean it. And I'm talking about healthy parenting. And so if you want to understand what it means to love someone you better love God first. You better seek after people who love God because if they don't understand how to love God and his love for them, they will never understand how to live in a loving relationship that adapts to your needs because that's the person that God wants to put in place to meet your needs. And I will tell you this, I have a burden for us as a community, but us as a church to pour into our young people to help them to understand there is grace in recovery in making mistakes. But it's a lot better life if I seek God first and let him guide me in the ways, the paths of good things so I don't have to worry about the recovery later on. I've become more aware of that issue in our community over the last couple of weeks. And I'll reveal where that came from at a later date. And now I pray, let the Spirit move and let him raise up our people. Let him raise up our moms and dads and our grandparents and our older citizens and our younger citizens and in a way that, that when people ask them, what is the difference? It's not some systematic movement you did because you read it out of a book. It's because of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you want to know what that's like, we can talk more about that. You see, when the Spirit causes the change and the Spirit reveals the place of brokenness, my life reveals Christ. 
I believe this answers a lot of problems that we have. I believe it solves financial issues. I believe it solves relational problems. It doesn't solve height. Sorry, if you're a small person, you want to play basketball, it doesn't really solve that problem for you. Except it tells you where your worth really is and where your identity lies. You want to be rich and you don't have a really rich job? Sorry, it doesn't answer that question other than where do my riches really lie? Are you so burdened for Christ to be revealed through you that you are begging for the Spirit to work you over? There's a new relationship in place, and God has given us an agent of transformation, this new relationship with the Spirit. And it's yours. It's not diminished. It's not partial. It's full of yours. It's your ability to understand how it works and to jump in and participate with it. But I guarantee you this, God is not withholding his Spirit from you. That's not how our God works. We're going to leave here today. I pray. Give thanks to God for the ways that you are seeing transformation take place. Beg and plead. Repent. And ask God to give you the power to overcome those things that reveal to you that the Spirit is not actively participating. He's not the thing that's happening in your life. There's still some fruit that's not His. Take, take grace in God's mercy that the only person who ever exhibited those fruits of the Spirit perfectly were Jesus Christ. But he gives us the power to live those things out. And that means you've got to spend some time in prayer. That means you've got to spend some time maybe in forgiveness. Maybe you've got to spend some time in worshiping. But that's why I love this morning when we were reminded that we have a good, good Father. And I was reminded that it's, it's in his presence, Right? that he is the cornerstone with which all of this is based upon, and he is a sure thing, never to falter, never to fail. And so I encourage you as his people, enjoy that. Let's take a moment and pray. I'm going to take us um, through, create some space that we can pray. Um, In a moment, I'll I'll ask our prayer team to come up. There will be a, a time you need to come up and maybe confess some things or Maybe you just need somebody to pray over you because of things that are happening in your life. Maybe you've got people that you're concerned about. I mean, this flu thing, we may have to start doing baptisms and hand sanitizer in the, in the, in the baptistry over here. I'm not sure what it's going to take to control this in our church, but, but it, it's a rampant thing. But maybe there's some people you need to pray for because they're, they're in health issues, financial, whatever it is. So there'll be some people who want to pray with you. They'll, they'll be up here. If you just want to grab somebody in your seat, then grab somebody in your seat and pray. Ask them, pray over me. I want, I want you to pray for me. They may not even, even know what to pray for. It's okay. One of the things the Spirit does is He intercedes for us. We're okay with that. We're going to have a moment of prayer. And then I'm going to ask our elders to come forward. Because we're about to enter into a time of review with our elders and, and to pray and to do some confession, some accountability. There are decisions that our elders are have to, having to make. And, and these are, are the burdens that they're having to carry because God has called them to a position of leadership in our church. And so I'm going to ask them to, to stand later on. I'm going to tell you when to stand. And people around them are going to gather and lay hands on our elders and, and pray over them. Because you understand that good captains lead good ships. Poor captains sink the boat. And I think that God has raised up some incredible men to lead this church and to serve we pray that he makes things very clear to them. So join me as we close this time in prayer. We pray for each other and we pray for our elders. Father, thank you for this morning. And what I ask is that we would continue to ask questions about the Spirit. There are times when the Spirit causes us to give a testimony. There are times when the Spirit draws us into prayer. And there are times when the Spirit reveals to us the mood of the situation. Is this, is this him that's revealing it or is there an evil spirit in the place? Father, you caution us against quenching the Spirit and rejecting it because it is the thing that allows us to live in relationship with you with this entire consequence. And so draw us into Scripture this week. Help us to understand with accuracy and as much as we can possibly do it, how to live in the power of the Spirit, how to glorify Christ. Father, thank you for the ways that you have taken away the old habits the old desires, the old motivations. 
Father, thank you for letting me hear the story of a father whose transformation completely changed his family. And you took a man who was hard, and you, you made him into a man who was a loving father. We pray that for our, our husbands and our, our fathers. We pray for our wives and our mothers. We pray for, for our students and our children. Because we have faith that it can happen. It is a, it is a thing that is not a, an if or a maybe. But Father, you are actively working that in every believer's heart, in their mind, in their soul, and in their actions. But Father, there are times when there are things happening to us and around us that we have a hard time bearing up underneath the weight. And so in this next moment as we pray, I, Father, I pray that there be people who pray for each other. As we see names of people to pray for, we, we lift them up, trusting that you are attending to those needs and the Spirit is present in those moments and those places. And that, Father, you are glorified through all of that. And so in this next moment, Father, guide our prayers. We pray these things in Christ's name. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forth. Come to the front. And we're going to make this time available to you as a congregation. And if you want to spend some time praying, come, come to the altar. If you want to grab somebody close to you and pray, then pray together, pray over each other. But this next moment is just a chance for you to lay things at God's feet and to have someone pray with you or pray over you. So I'm going to invite you to stand as we observe this time of prayer together and this time of, of ministry. And I ask that you just simply respond to however God leads you to.
We're going to close our service today by asking our elders to identify themselves. So we have Eric Kier is over here. Um, Brett Farney is over here. We have uh, Clayton and we have Kenny. Uh, David Stallings, I think, has stepped out of the service. So um, I'm going to ask if um, I'm gonna ask Tim would represent David. And so um, if you're close to these men, um, Clayton and, and Gail, if you guys will come back, go back to your seat, Brent, if you go back to yours. Just gather around if you're close by. If not, you just kind of reach a hand out. Um, and I'm going to give a moment for the congregation just to pray. So if you're not close to them, you can still pray for them. And, and what I want you to understand is, is one that God affirms that, that the position he has called them to do, that he is calling them to do it. That if there's some things that need to be confessed and, and dealt with within the elders, that they would find the strength to do that. That they would, as leaders of the church, understand that you may not be able to talk to them all the time, but that God would move you to figure out how to support them and encourage them. And that the, the decisions they're going to have to make in the days to come, that they would find courage and strength to make those because of spiritual influence. And so once I think the congregation's had a chance to pray over that, then I'll close this in prayer and we'll be dismissed for the morning. So if you can, gather around the, the elders. I'm going to open us up. I'm going to leave it for a moment of silence for you to pray. You can pray out loud. You can pray quietly, whatever. Then when I think we've had a chance, I'll, I'll close this out. So, Father, we, um, we lift up our elders to you. For Brent, for David, for Kenny, for Eric, and Clayton. And, Father, you have called these men to a position in the church that uh, sometimes is perceived as a, a place of glory and, and power. But, Father, what we see in Scripture is a place of service. It's a place of discernment, a place of wisdom, a place of ministry. And so this next moment, I pray that our people would petition you on their behalf. We pray for wisdom, we pray for, for guidance and strength, for the things that they struggle with, that, Father, you would give them strength, for the, for the ways you've called them and, and the equipping you've given them, that, Father, you would exercise that in this body. And so now hear the prayers of your people over our elders. So, Father, you've heard the prayers of your people. You know the hearts of our elders. And, Father, continue to equip them and call them and affirm them. And, Father, encourage them and strengthen them. Continue to let them demonstrate to us what it looks like to be a person who lives this new covenant being worked on by the Spirit. Father, thank you for revealing that in Scripture this morning. And I pray as we leave this place that we would be hungry to seek after the thing that the Spirit gives. Life in equipping us to glorify your Son who is the path of salvation for everyone. And so, Father, thank you for an incredible day today of singing praises and hymns. Father, of, of seeing and, and shaking hands and sharing fellowship. And Father, thank you for your word that was spoken and the time to pray. And now commission us to go out into this world, Father. Let us glorify you out there. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.